Hi, my name is Philip Martin, and I am the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery in Los Angeles with my partner, Portia Hine. It usually takes a few minutes for people to come into the webinar here. So we'll just give people a moment of time here. Oh, good, nice. Well, there's a number of people coming in. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, okay, so my name is Philip Martin and I'm the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery in Los Angeles with my partner, Portia Hine. And I hope that you've had a chance to meet Portia either at the gallery or at the fairs. Um, this is a conversation that I have very much been looking forward to, which is the opportunity to talk to John Joseph Mitchell. Um, I have been obsessed, <laughs> John, with your work since, um, since I first saw it. And I'm really thrilled that we are doing an online exhibition of 10 paintings right now called A Cat in the Other Room. And we'll be doing a solo exhibition with John's work in, I think, early when early spring of next year uh, here in Los Angeles. So if you have any questions, just feel free to email me about the works. Um, John, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm so thrilled that we could have this conversation and talk a little bit about your paintings. Um, I don't know if they're where where we want to start, but we were just talking about where you are, and you were saying that you live in in a rural area, kind of where where you grew up in New Jersey. I am, you know, lived in Southern California now longer than anywhere. Tell us a little bit about just the immediate landscape around you, because landscape seems to be a big part of your work. Yeah, sure, it's huge. Um, yeah, as you say, I was I was raised here and this is where I'm familiar with. And this is sort of the scenes around here are what occupy my, uh, you know, my imaginary, you know, world. You know, when I think of a landscape, I think of a marsh with the edge of forest behind it because that's what it looks like around here. Um, it's sort of, uh, I'm in a small town, small rural town that is sort of in between the Pine Barrens National Preserve, and then the resort ocean towns of the uh, barrier islands of New Jersey. So along that stretch, there's like 15, 20 miles wide for uh, almost the you know extent of the bottom of New Jersey that is sort of quaint little rural towns. And uh, it's really, it's a really beautiful landscape, old area. Um, old houses. The house I live in is over 200 years old, you know, so it has like a rich colonial history, lots of farms, beautiful woods and beautiful marshes, and of course the ocean. So, you know, when we start with a painting like this one, for example, since we're going to, since we're talking about landscape, I kind of advanced it. May, we'll head back actually maybe in some reverse order, so to speak. This yeah. painting is called A Fisherman in the Rain. In the rain. What are we looking at here? Yeah, so um, right across the street from my house is the is a uh, wildlife game preserve, which these areas sort of speckle the entire region. There's these, you know, several square mile mile zones for wildlife and uh, game preservation. And so I go over there, and there's sort of it's marsh and tide pools and uh, you. Know, uh, it's all sort of around this uh, the Great Egg Harbor Bay, which is a huge tributary into the ocean, and there's woods that butt up against it. And it's one of my favorite places in the world. I just get on a bicycle and I ride, and I most of the images come from that area. Well, not most, a lot of images. And uh, so, is this an image that you? Is this a scene that you've seen that you actually saw, or so you know, the, the landscape? Yeah, the landscape is certainly like what I saw. Um, and then the figure and the boat is from another observation. And things tend to get pieced together that way, mm -hmm. where I uh, I go out into the world, I observe things, make drawings, make sketches, make notes, uh, notes about color primarily. And then I get back into the studio and I kind of just start piecing things together but they it always comes from observation there's always like there needs to be a sense of 
uh, reality to it for me to uh, get excited about and uh, and play with. Well, I think one of the things about this particular painting that I really enjoyed when I was looking at is that somehow, you know, I I don't read subject matter the way other people do. I think, you know, we all come to paintings in our own way and some people maybe see material content, meaning <clears throat> what the paint is, what the paint's doing. Other people might see subject matter who's depicted what they're doing. I'm more of a material content person. And I think for me, visually, I really enjoyed the rhythm and the brushwork in the back of the painting in quotes. Although we can also talk about vertical landscapes or perspectival landscapes. But in this painting, then to realize the title is Fisherman in the Rain and that that regular brushwork is not only putting something in space or putting something into the picture plane, but there's all it's also the rhythmic action of the motion of the painting itself. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, um, the the sort of like the challenge of like painting rain is something I've like always enjoyed. There's this uh, the one Van Gogh painting of the rain of the wheat field in the rain that he painted uh -huh. from like his window in Arles. It's the best rain painting ever, uh -huh. and somehow he was able to make a pattern that had this uh, depth to it and at the same time is so bound to the surface. Uh -huh. You know, his, his marks are scratched, almost like chiseled into the surface. Yeah. And certain marks for the rain are heavy on top of the surface, heavy dogs yeah. of paint. And the, that, that sort of range as it is like that picture is kind of like always in the back of my mind so with that painting I, I was just really trying to figure out you know just like that how do you get how do you get depth of field you know and this surface pattern to read as a beautiful natural phenomenon you know I don't know if it was successful or not but it, it ended up there you know so are you know for the viewers are your paintings scratched into I mean I we in terms sure. of so the line work in the in the trees that we saw in the previous picture, maybe perhaps here in the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, on the on the sort of like a uh, shelf of my easel, there's a couple of two inch common nails, a uh -huh. uh, an etching needle, and a few uh, pottery tools, and they all lend themselves. To now you have a print background painting, with the paint and into the yeah yeah so um. Screen printing is sort of like my first foray into art. And then I uh, went to school for lithography. And now my primary focus is on, in, in terms of printmaking, my primary focus is on relief prints and on monotypes. And mm -hmm. monotypes particularly uh, inform my painting practice. In fact, I would consider my painting practice an extension of my monotypes. Oh, that's interesting. What do you mean by that? So the the monotypes are the way I get to really uh, create unfiltered, just because I'm so familiar with the materials and the medium. It's what I'm sort of, it's the way I sort of like feel I naturally want to work. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to figure things out in the monotypes that then I bring into the, the paintings. Do you want to clarify for the audience who might not be as familiar with printmaking, what the materials in a monotype is and what a monotype itself is? Obviously a unique print um, and maybe a little bit about the uniqueness of, uh, of a print, say, and the uniqueness of a painting or, or the ways in which those things connect for you. Sure, yeah. So um, most printmaking methods involve altering a surface, a hard surface of some kind. You call mm -hmm. a matrix. So you either chisel away at the surface of that matrix so that mm -hmm. ink sits on top, or you scratch into that surface that ink sits into those scratches. And then you're able to duplicate, uh, you're able to print from that matrix as many times as you want to make an infinite number of prints. Monotype, you don't alter the surface of the 
the material you're working on. You simply put paint or ink on top, work the ink or the paint around with whatever materials you have at hand, and then run that through the press with the paper and make a unique print. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the sort of benefit for me of that process is there's a total lack of preciousness and there's a total um, element of sort of lack of con lack of total control. It, mm -hmm. It's it's imprecise, and mm -hmm. what you're able to do is really have to work in ways that focus on big design concepts. On, Interesting. On ulti yeah, ultimately on just like the 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 pattern of the 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 shapes and the the composition that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense because obviously we can get to discussing shape and some other questions, or maybe now's the time you want to talk about say a because a, a language of shapes and those kinds of compositions and how they interact in your work. Yeah, so this is this is definitely a good one to start with. So mm -hmm. for me, um the the entire like uh, advantage of painting over other forms of pictures of a painting over other forms of pictures is that it's always going to be an object and it's always going to be perceived to have depth like the mm -hmm. moment you put a mark on a piece of paper you see that mark against the white piece of paper and it and it creates it creates space but it's still just a piece of paper right. and playing with that objecthood of the painting is the the entire like entertainment for me and uh -huh. shape in its all of its uh in its essence is just breaking that plane down that surface down into other planes and the the way for me to the sort of like entrance for me into breaking up the surface of the painting into shapes is well there's got to be a range there's got to be a spectrum there's got to be big and small mm -hmm. you know and so if you have a spectrum of big and small shapes and your spectrums here well if you you know sort of focus on certain points of that spectrum well then you start to get a, a, a composition then you start to get a design and mm -hmm. and so if i have like in this painting i have the dark green area that's my big shape. Mm -hmm. And then I have the, the white areas, my medium shapes, the light green area, also a medium shape. And then the cat is ultimately the smallest shape. But <laughs> because of that, so with that contrast, you know, with I've filled this, this area with big and then, you know, big to medium shapes. And then a small thing, well, then you have a focal point, you know? Yeah. So the way you sort of like chop that spectrum up and the areas you focus on, that's how you're going to get your composition in space. And and that 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 like thinking of the range of shape or even any any element of picture making as a spectrum that you sort of pick what points you want to utilize in a painting. That's sort of the way I enter everything. Well, I love this painting and this is, you know, your, this painting is called a cat in the other room. And, um, well, I, <clears throat> I have a, I have a weakness for pathetic, pathetic physics interpretations. Um, but I like that it's a cat in the other room and not the cat in the other room, yeah. meaning that in some sense, it makes me think of Schrodinger's cat in the sense that in that way, it's the cat. <laughs> You'll just have to pardon me here. <laughs> but the cat is kind of almost hypothetical in this funny way, of course. And then in in the Schrodinger idea, there's this there's that idea of, of what what is a fixed thing? What does that mean? And then in your painting, is the cat <laughs> is the cat in the other room? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so much of those questions hinge on how you've constructed the space. You know, how do you, 
how do you keep, I mean, how do you keep it in this like zone? Or let me let me back it up. Do you feel like ambiguity uh, is a part of your work or creating kind of the possibility for the viewer to have an open interpretation of like, where this this cat exactly? Yeah, of, of course. Um, ambiguity is, I don't know if that's like the exact word I would yeah. choose. There's a certain type of, um, for me, these things are so specific. Like yeah. that, that is my cat, that is my, that is my uh, clothes hanger for drying my clothes. That I had that chest next to the door. Like these things are so specific. Yeah. Um, but they're mine. They're not. They're not. They're not the viewers. They're not whoever's looking at them. So yeah. They need to be. They need to be treated in in a hypothetical sense, like you say. Like these things are all just metaphors. You know that it, sure. it doesn't. It doesn't matter to whoever's looking at this thing whether this is real or not. It matters to yeah. me for in the making of it that it has to come from a place for me to get to make a painting. Yeah. But they need to get, you know, the the point in which they end and, you know, I hang them on the wall and I'm done with making them is when they get to this is when they get to this place where they are seemingly um you know, they're 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 felt you they are yeah they they can be um like they're believable in a, in a sense that they are you can believe that this is a real place but it yeah. doesn't really matter if it is or not you know it's sure it's just it's just a a zone for your eyes to eyes to wander and um so yeah, I want things to be specific and universal and vague and and complex, like all at the same time. Well, that's that's such a great answer, and I think there's so, so much to to get into right there. But you know, I use the word ambiguity. <clears throat> Perhaps that's me. Uh, it's I'm glad that you kind of clarify that I, that it, it, I think I like that because um, I use the word ambiguity, but I suppose I'm using that word because in a certain sense, like you could be creating, you could just be using perspective lines and saying, boom, like this is Italy, Quattrocento Italy, you are right there, 200 feet away from me, and I'm going to measure that. Mm -hmm. I think what's interesting is that, you know, paintings are communication objects. Paintings are this conversation. Your relationship is maybe with, with the thing you're looking at and it's with the painting, but you know that the viewer's relationship is always going to be with the painting. True. And it's interesting how you can't, how in your work, I think it's very, it's this incredibly beautiful thing. I think when an artist can allow can kind of create this generosity of communicating with another person. And I think that's a big part of your work. And I, it's interesting to hear you say that you're creating a space where you, it very much feels like you, it very much feels very real and exactly what it needs to be. But yet it's also able to function as this communication object where to me, um, there's a lot of space for me to enter and kind of animate it on my own, which of course is what art objects are. If paintings aren't doing that, then we might as well just put them in the closet. Sure, I think I I think a huge like part of my goal of when and and a I don't know goal uh, a huge part of how I determine whether like I like I like a painting or not, and whether it's done or I need to keep working on it is when it's at this place where it doesn't it doesn't demand your attention it doesn't demand a a certain amount of uh, of 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 your of your brain and of your of of your you know senses but it really does allow for a in in and out and a return and the ability to be um, looked at and 
you can place many different emotions on it. You can be sad and look at a painting and continue to be sad, or you can be happy and look at a painting and continue right. to be happy. And it can have these, it can have this openness for, for visual pleasure within the range of like, yeah, the experiences you're going to have throughout your life and the emotions you're going to have. And yeah. Painting, if paintings are going to be there to be lived with, I'm, 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 I make them to be, in, you know, to be on my walls and to hopefully be on other people's walls. Well, then I think they have to be respectful of the fact that, yeah, people and are going to look at them in a different space. It's interesting because I guess that's it. You know, it's actually precisely not am, am, uh, ambiguous at all. It's actually the opposite of that. It's it's real in the way reality is real. Like mm -hmm. there, you know, the reality, yeah. Um, okay, we can, <laughs> thank you, love that. Let's, uh, <laughs> so this one's called A Baker's Donkey. And this is one of the few that has a very specific title to me, a more specific title. Or Where does this title come from and what are we looking at? Yeah, so uh, uh, six or seven miles down the road from me is a donut <laughs> shop, is a donut shop called Frog Hollow Donuts. And it's, they make the most amazing donuts. And in the field next to their little shack, they have a donkey and <laughs> um and their donuts are delicious and jimmy the donkey lives there and me and my girlfriend drive there and get donuts and sometimes she goes and hangs out with the donkey and this is this is just the you know that's what this is yeah. i just thought maybe this was like a it's almost like a parable of some kind but it's actually it's actually something that's in your immediate reality okay yeah. that brings you to the next question Mm -hmm. is do you think your work relates to uh, a Northeast landscape tradition or, or, or do you have any thoughts? I don't know. Yeah, I hope so. Um, I, I, I very much would like to have that be a part of, way they, of the way they are seen. Um, uh -huh. The I think that there's a something very unique about um, American painting and American like little American landscape painters and genre painters that is no matter how much they tried to mimic European trends and yeah. impressionism or whatnot they they could never quite do it because they were never totally in it they weren't from those academies there's a certain um there's a, a sort of lack of uh what's the word i'm looking for there's just a lack of like academicness to them mm -hmm. in a more simple naive structure mm -hmm. in the way that painters such as Albert Pinkham Ryder, which this painting obviously, mm -hmm. um, I was looking at him when I was making this painting. There, there's a certain like immediacy, like with the subject that I think is differentiates Northeast American painting, as you say, from from say like French modernist painting, or you mm -hmm. know, beginning with like Courbet, whoever you want to start with. Right. Where our Pinkham Rider sees a full moon and he's willing to put the full moon in the center, you know, mm -hmm. and he's willing to make the the clouds brighter than they should be. And he's willing to do these things for the sake of subject matter and symbolism that is almost that is uh maybe like more illustrious illustrational or something than mm -hmm. than European artists were willing to be mm -hmm. and 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 in that way I sort of I hope that I can sort of fit in line with some of that that's so interesting so a certain kind of desire to communicate yeah for sure for sure and a um a a just the just the directness not mm -hmm. to to you know if 
like if this, if I'm trying to make a a painting of this still life, um, where I put these like roses on a, in a vase and put on the chair, the chair I'm sitting in right now, and drape some cloths and you know put in this landscape. If I'm gonna do that, like goes in the middle, you know, like there's not, there doesn't need to be a uh, uh, a fussiness about the design. In fact, that's like sort of like the 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 biggest challenge I set forth with myself is to like not be fussy about the design and the drawing to mm -hmm. to get it down, start from there, and then it's like the colors I pick have to make that work. You yeah. know, I try not to let my, myself move things too much. I try to force myself to have to make the colors work. Uh, for the for the way I set the, the painting up. Well, so now we're kind of going back in time a little bit because of these are some older works. Mm -hmm. Basically at the end here, um, this has been a great conversation. Is there anything you want to talk about that we haven't talked about? Um, I, I guess just like the general like materiality sure. um, of the things like the, they're they're on wood. The, the frames I make, I put the frames on the wood before I even start painting the picture. So I paint the frames the entire time with, with the picture. Uh -huh. And that goes back to sort of like, I think where we, maybe the first or second point we, we, we were at where the paintings need to be an object. Like I like, I can, I like to, to be able to touch them and hold them in this, yeah. this, and you know, and they're small, and that scale allows for them to to feel like a a thing. And then when you look at the thing, when you look at the object, then then space can recede, and yeah. then you can be in a picture, you know. Yeah. And then this is an interesting one, only in that it's more. Um, yeah, it's a little more observed in a certain sense. And yeah, and it, and it it definitely is. I try to, um, you know, try try to work within a range of mm -hmm. of abstract to observe to representational. And um, this is actually, I think, the first painting I made in when I moved to the house that I live in now. This is the first painting I made in my studio, which is behind me. So it was very much like observation like yeah. getting to know my surroundings my my new world here oh, that's interesting yeah. mm -hmm. well thanks so much for the conversation today i really appreciate it yeah um, thank you it's enjoyable uh john's show is uh online it's called a cat in the other room and there's also an artist page with some references that are resources for you there. And as I say, we're going to be doing a show coming up, though. I'm really excited about that. And um, there's a couple of group shows that are happening and some other stuff. So stay tuned. John, thanks so much for doing this with me. This is awesome. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure. Have a great yeah. weekend.